All right, welcome everyone. Yeah, really excited to be here at Venture Cafe and streaming to our virtual audience on SQL. And this is part of our startup spring week. And um, yeah, we've been doing a lot of events all around the TechCrunch conference uh, that's happening tomorrow. We posted some at um, District Hall in Seaport, Mass Challenge, and also in Seaport. We're here at Venture Cafe in Cambridge tonight. And then um, there's the conference at the Heinz Convention Center tomorrow. And uh, we have a couple events, um, a breakfast, and then a, um, an event at District Hall on Friday as well. And yeah, we're really excited for this one especially because we've been working with our cohort and the accelerator program for the last 12 weeks. And all of them have grown a lot, done an amazing job throughout the program. Um, and yeah, we're really excited for them to share their pitches and presentations with all of you tonight. And um, yeah, basically the format's gonna be 10 minute presentations followed by Q&A from the audience. And we'll also moderate any uh, virtual questions coming in as well. And uh, you know, this is just a chance to really connect, get to know all the opportunities that are out there. Um, whether, you know, I know we have attendees that are investors and looking for their next investment opportunity. Um, we have attendees that are, you know, um, looking for startups to join or, you know, um, early companies, they, the startup community. One of the things we love about it is, you know, you're really excited to uh, jump in and try new things and be an early adopter of platforms and technologies and products as well. So, you know, um, whatever the connection is, uh, they're all going to have their own kind of call to action and ways to help and support. Um, but yeah, you know, just excited to make all these connections here, share the incredible stories from a variety, you know, um, we actually try to keep uh, the cohorts and the types of companies pretty diverse too, where nobody is really competing with each other in the program. They're all open to sharing ideas. They come from different sectors and, um, you know, they all come together and help each other throughout the program and beyond. So yeah, thanks again, everybody that's coming out. Um, and yeah, excited to kick off. I'll just share really quickly our um, overview here. These are these are the companies that are presenting. We're going to hear from uh, Coils to Locks. Uh, we'll kick us off, followed by um, Arrow, Arrow Social, AO Planner, and then Pernamed. And again, each of them will have a 10-minute presentation and then open Q&A. And also keep the chat, uh, if you're online, you know, keep that interactive too, if you want to share um, kind of what brings you out to the night um, and, you know, any questions along the way. And with that, I'm going to share the first presentation and I'm excited to bring Diane and Pamela from Coyos to Locks to uh, kick us off. So I'd like you to imagine for a moment, you've just been diagnosed with cancer and to add insult to injury, your oncologist says to you, you're going to lose every single strand of your hair due to the chemotherapy cocktail that will be used to eradicate that cancer. But there's hope because the oncologist also tells you that there's this industry that you were not aware of that existed that supports individuals who are interested in wigs because of medical hair loss. So he writes a wig prescription. It's called a cranial prosthesis. And he says, go to any cancer center, hospital, medical hair loss salon and find a wig. And by the way, check your health insurance plan because you may have coverage for that wig. You check your health insurance plan, you have coverage for the wig, and then you start looking 
you go to the hospital where you're being treated and there's nothing there that resonates with you. And then you go to other hospitals and then you start calling hospitals out of state. You start calling hospitals and medical hair loss salons across the country. And what you find is that none of these spaces that have been set up to support individuals with medical hair loss have wigs that look like this. That was my experience. I was absolutely in need of a wig because I had two weeks after my first chemotherapy treatment to find a wig, but I wasn't able to find one. I'm Diane Austin. I'm a cancer survivor and thriver. I'm also the CEO and co-founder of Coils to Locks. And I'm Pamela Shattuck. I am COO and co-founder of Coils to Locks, and you'll hear more from me in a, in a little bit. This is a disparity that we wanted to end in the medical hair loss space. And that's, what Coils, that's how Coils to Locks was born. So you might be surprised to learn that 50%, nearly 50% of Black women in the U.S. alone are experiencing or living with some form of either medical or non-medical hair loss. And that's almost 12 million women. But make no mistake, if you are interested in a wig for medical hair loss reasons or for any type of hair loss, it's not a vanity product. And people often make that mistake. This is a product that helps you to maintain your sense of self your dignity, your control over your circumstances during what is a very, very difficult time. But we have the solution. You'll see here on the screen our display of beautiful, high quality, synthetic, coily, curly wigs. And we also have hats with hair, both braided hats with hair and coiled dreadlock style hats with hair. We call them Kimmy caps, named after our big sister. And we feel that our wigs, we know that our wigs are making a difference in medical hair loss spaces. So I'd like to bring your attention to Pat. Pat is a repeat Coils to Locks customer. And she reached out to us to let us know that when she was getting her cancer treatment in New York, she was very interested in finding a coily, curly, highly textured wig, but there were no spaces that had these wigs available. So she actually drove to Boston when we were first, uh, we partnered with our first three hospitals to purchase one of our wigs. That's how important these wigs are for people to have culturally sensitive wigs that they can relate to so that when you look in the mirror, you see your, uh, yourself, someone that you recognize. No one should have to drive hundreds of miles just to get a wig that resonates with them. But she did, and she shared that with us. And she was able to have a, a dignified experience in a private setting, working with a wig fitter or a licensed cosmetologist. And she could have that privacy and nurturing environment that she needed to get the wig that she wanted. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our business model. It's two tier. We have a B2B business model, and then we have a direct-to-consumer business model. The B2B business model consists of, right now we're in a proof of concept stage, we're moving out of that stage actually, consists of 15 hospitals and we're about to add three new hospitals and one medical hair loss salon um, in the next week or so. A hospital will reach out to us because they've heard about us, or we'll reach out to a hospital we will meet with them, talk to them about our wig collection, send them information digitally on our, the, the wig collection catalog, our wholesale prices, FAQs, and then they have an opportunity to look at that information after having that conversation. And usually they're ready to buy at that point. We then send them a link where they can access, register and access a private website, wholesale website, and once they're registered, they can purchase wigs at any time. On the direct-to-consumer side, which is our new e-commerce store side, um, that is in, we're, we did a soft launch and we're working with a digital marketing strategist 
who is helping us with search engine optimization for the site, lead generation, um, social media advertising. So in the next few weeks, we're planning on doing a very aggressive launch of this website, the e-commerce site. On both the B2B side and the e-commerce side, um, individuals who purchase our Wix can get an invoice if they have um, health insurance reimbursement coverage. You don't need that to purchase a wig, but many people have that coverage. And that helps support the process of healthcare reimbursement on both the, the e commerce and the direct to consumer side. So let's talk about the market opportunity. So, market research shows that black consumers are driving an annual 13 percent growth in the wig and hair extension market in north america uh, the u.s being the largest market and according to nielsen black women outspend other demographics by nearly 86 percent in ethnic hair care and beauty um, our primary market which is composed of 12 million black women are living with some form of hair loss, whether it be due to chemotherapy, uh, autoimmune diseases, um, through medications that they're taking, uh, as well as through hairstyling choices that can cause traction alopecia, which I have. So using a bottoms up approach, um, our potential revenue, the potential revenue for Coil Salox is 4.5 million on the uh, in our primary market and 9.2 million in our secondary market. Um, in regards to the competition, the uh, Deloitte research tells us that in the hair, wig, and extension industry, that um, it's it's a highly fragmented uh, industry, and there are no major players. Um, so. Retailers often um, just focus on, um, they operate on a regional level and just focus on um, adding value pro uh, through products, right? Um, there are no players with significant control over the market. And our competitors, they are mainly focusing on selling to Caucasian women. Costa Lox's value add in this space is through the lens of cultural sensitivity. Um, through our lived experience as Black women with hair loss, um, and we are our target market, right? Um, it's through the education and support that we um, give to our vendors and individual customers. And of course, it's through our high quality, ethnically inspired wig styles that we provide. So we started Coils to Locks in uh, late October of 2019 in three Boston hospitals and grew to 15 hospitals nationwide in our proof of concept stage. We sold 230 wigs, um, which uh, totaled $43,000 in revenue. Uh, we've also raised money uh, over $140,000 in non-dilutive funding. Uh, over uh, just at $68,000 through an equity crowdfunding campaign through the WeFunder platform. And we have had some nice attention through uh, major press opportunities. So as we move out of this proof of concept stage, um, we plan on growing our hospital networks um, and driving both on the B2B and direct-to-consumer side, driving that growth equally in both of those models. Uh, through a target vendor list that was compiled for us by Deloitte, um, we see ourselves doubling our hospital um, networks and not just individual hospitals, but really tapping, tapping into those hospital networks, uh, doubling that by the end of the year. Um, we are um, in conversations now with Canada. Um, Canada reached out to us. They actively pursued us, an organization in Canada that um, works directly with the retail hair loss um, retailers there. And we are about to finalize the um, process of selling internationally in Canada. And our third and fourth quarter projections in 2023 
we see ourselves selling at least um, getting to 100 wigs a month, which would give us $20,000 in revenue per month. Um, and that's a, a conservative projection. So you've met the co-founders. Additional team members include a chief engagement officer who also works in business development, um, our web um, uh, developer slash assistant, and our team uh, collectively has 20 plus years of experience and um, they uh, have expertise in the areas. It, it consists of two cancer survivors um, and experts in the areas of um, diversity and inclusion, cancer support, natural hair blogging, and communications. So I mentioned that we um, are on the equity crowdfunding platform, the WeFunder platform. And what we would love for people to do here today, what we would encourage people to do is to go um, scan the QR code here, um, type in the URL, and invest in Coils to Lots. We are open to having um, VC conversations off of the WeFunder platform, but you can um, today, for as little as $100, um, of course you'll invest much more, but for as little as $100, you can invest in Coils to Lots' growth right now. Um, with that $250,000 that we raise, raise on WeFunder, which is our goal, um, we will, tap into buying um, additional wig styles, hiring a, a business development professional, a supply chain and inventory uh, management expert, and put money towards um, our marketing, including advertising. So with that, I am going to hand it off to Diane to close. So wigs for medical hair loss or any type of head, uh, hair loss, as I mentioned earlier, is not a vanity product. We're making a difference in a space where these wigs do not exist. And we've been able to verify that with cancer center retailers, with clinicians, both physicians and nurses, and certainly with our target market of black women who have experienced all forms of hair loss. So we're excited about the road that's ahead of us. We're excited that we're moving out of this proof of concept stage and soft launch and really diving into growing this business into the multi-million, dare I say, billion dollar business that it can be. And we appreciate your time and we're opening up the floor to any questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, great presentation. Uh, yeah, any questions from the audience? Sure. This is great, very good uh, for the societal area. Extremely. A couple of questions I have. Like for the first question is, um, I know you, you presented how much is the revenue growth you value, you value, right? I'm not sure whether you can share what is the margin looks like, because I'm also an investor, founder of other company as well. Second thing is, um, uh, I'm not sure whether you can share this, but is there like where what are we going to provide in the way right how are you getting the raw materials or suppliers for the way? so our profit margins right now are close to 80 percent we see that um probably getting a little lower as we begin to um you know build up our team but um we have very healthy profit margins our wigs are are purchased overseas and we work with two manufacturers who curate designs for us. So for example, we may share with them that, you know, we're looking for a, um, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the 70s, but I still say Afro, Afro style wig, <laughs> Afro style wig um, with bangs, for example. And we make sure, you know, pictures with them and that type of thing, and then they'll design the wigs for us. They use, um, the materials used are, uh, high quality Japanese fiber. I, I did mention that the wigs are synthetic wigs, but um, this Japanese fiber, which this particular company has um, their own formulation, um, creates wig fibers that look like real hair. Now, Pamela is wearing one of our wigs. She's wearing one of our wigs um, today. So it looks, it, looks, it feels like real hair. So I hope I answered I think I answered, if I yeah. didn't answer all of your questions, 
Thank you. He nicely gave us an out and said, if you can answer. <laughs> oh, yeah, he did say that. That's right. Okay. Have you thought about marketing with the drug companies that sell chemotherapy, um, chemotherapy uh, treatments? Oh, that's a good question. No, we have not thought about that. I mean, the, what we've thought about is, and which we, what we will implement is um, working with the health insurance providers, right. but not the, the drug companies. That's an interesting um, Thought. May even be able to get them to something to look at yeah. to uh, supple, you know, to subsidize part of that in terms yeah. of drugs. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, there is a question on that. It's more of curiosity than anything else. Are, are visual weight makers competition, or or this is a completely empty market? And then the uh, kind of the second question is financial. Is the total market that is available that you described was that the U.S. market alone? So, Going to Canada, expand market. Yeah. So do you want to? That's the US market, right? I'll yeah, let you go. You got okay. it. Because I have the right to that mic. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a couple of questions in there. Um, the numbers that we provided are just the US market alone. We do have some figures for the Canadian market. I think um, it, you would add another maybe 2 million women on the Canadian in the Canadian market. And then the UK was probably just under a million women who um, we have the potential to to market to. And I'm sorry, there was another part. I just want to, just to even add to that, there, those markets have actually started reaching out to us. It was in our intention to like, sort of go global and international, but before we even had a chance to even think about that, because we're concerned with the US, right? Um, they started reaching out to us, different organizations or individuals, whether on social media, things like that. So, yeah. So, uh, he, 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 uh, but um, are traditional weight makers competition? Thank you for repeating that question. What we found is that the U.S. the the, the traditional U.S. weight distributors have not been um, meeting the needs of this market, and so um, technically they're in competition because right now you know we're we're at an early stage in the business, so any of these larger distri distributors could swoop in and try to you know take some of this market but we believe that one based on the fact that we are our market we understand the, the black culture hair culture that you know that we have some advantages there but we have confirmed and this isn't just Pamela and I saying this we've had many conversations before we even launched the business with these cancer center retail stores these medical hair loss salons with clinicians and other patient advocates who support individuals with hair loss. And they told us time and time and time again that there was a gap in this market. The retailers yeah. were saying, we've been looking for these wigs for 10 years. We had someone say 20 years, mm -hmm. for many years. And we've been asking for these wigs and we haven't been able to get them. Should I just? Sorry, I have a question. Now, my wife has alopecia. Uh, she went to the same farm trying to find wigs and raw plastics and fall apart. She, if, we had to go to Australia, they do natural hair, and they give you a cap, a suction cup cap. So she has to shave her hair all off, but I was wondering, how does yours fit it? Because that's one of the problems my wife had, because she, she wants to go in the water, she wants to do things, and she's, so she has, it's a plastic, and they really, they sew it all together, and they ship it back. It's about five or $7,000 per week, and she gets wow. three a year. Because yes. of the, Styles, and then she gets styled at a salon too. So how is, is I mean, that's yeah. one of the issue my my wife had is the fitting and the use of the wig. And she's also using um, doing human hair or synthetic hair. Human hair. He's human hair. Yeah, yeah. But that um, matches exactly to whatever color she wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now um, we don't have anything of that sort. It's a standard wig cap. Um, the only difference in our wig cap is that, like in traditional wigs, they would have combs in them where they could anchor, you know, the, the wig to their own hair. But when you're dealing with women with no hair or hair loss, they don't have that. So we use a, a, silk, a, a silk, ours are made with a silicone grip, kind of a strip that um, is very secure. Like I can do, like it doesn't move. Um, <laughs> I'm glad it did not move. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so it 
it's but the the material it's like a soft cotton um one of the things that we want to move into is the monofilament caps which is uh definitely uh used more in the hair loss community but we are using a, a softer cap but it's not like I wouldn't say it's waterproof or, 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 or ready. It's not quite as advanced as that. We're not she saying. She uses long term. Yeah, and she does everything in it, it, right? She's working out in it. She's swimming yeah, in it. She's she doing. Lives it. She lives. Yeah. The whole yeah. process in the morning and putting her on. And we're going to research that tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So no, our our weights are don't do that yet. So I I'm I, I love impactful businesses. I do the same thing. It's, terrific and i love hearing from you guys um, can you help us understand like super compelling story but the elephant in the room is like why is the gap why is the gap there is it a help us understand is it like the sociological thing is it a you know an economic incentive thing like it seems like there's something that should have been addressed you know decades ago yeah well what we you know, discovered um, and uh, just even for ourselves as we were going through this um, journey in our pre-launch stage that if this was a healthcare disparity, let's start there, it was a healthcare disparity because um, the, the market seemed to, or these distributors only seemed to be serving one segment of the population. Um, and uh, I think and, and, and you know, I, mean, I would you, say you like have, the why, you live the experience, yes. so you might want. To. I mean, the why your question is a good one because I mean we can only assume that it's based on unconscious bias, a, under, a lack of understanding of this market of um, black women and hair loss. If you don't know the market or understand the market or or take the time to learn about the market, you're not going to know that it's a problem that exists. So that's the only. Um, thought that we've had around it. I mean, I, I wish I knew. I mean, this is a, a business that is entrenched, the U.S. wig industry, particularly around medical hair loss, non-medical hair loss. It's existed for decades. And so the fact that no one is actively pursuing this target market, like, you know, big question mark. Yeah, and I would just make share, something. based on your story, I remember, I remember Diane being so excited when she got, got armed with her wig prescription and she was ready to go out and get this wig and then started going to these cancer retail spaces and was just shocked because it was 2015 at the time. She's like, it's 2015, like, where are these wigs? Um, and so that's what prompted us to start doing the research across the country. We were like, I took the West Coast, she took the East Coast, and we started calling um, based on a U.S. News and World report of where all the major cancer hospitals are and, and that sort of thing that had these retail stores and we found that it was systemic um, and so again we could only deduce that it's just like you know they're they're not seeing the need because the need um, is not in their world it's just you know I'm sorry I, I noticed your hands been raised a few times I'm sorry We're a distributor to them, but what most of the, what we have found that many of the health insurance plans that cover the cost of wigs or medical hair loss have a, a healthcare reimbursement model. So hospitals are helping to support that by making sure that the buyer has the type of invoice needed in order to then submit for reimbursement, which is a formal invoice. You know, logo has to say cranial prosthesis or hair prosthesis on the invoice. And then we do the same on the e-commerce side to support that. We are. The consumer would go to their insurer, but they need the right documentation to take uh, with them. So both on our e-commerce side and then the hospital vendors and the medical hair loss salons are both supporting the consumer's ability to, to submit for reimbursement. Last follow-up to what you were asking. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I often have been a customer coach last year. Uh, I'm a little familiar with this. Um, how big is the market segment of the medical necessity of like the reimbursement versus the consumer? Because I know, I know like the, just the different hairstyles cause this to be a very big issue later on in the black community for a lot of what I know many of them have um, 
essentially allocation from what, what do you call it? Yeah, the traction. So what, traction what allocation. allocation. What's, this, what's the split between what would be, let's say, medically covered or potentially medically covered versus just the traction allocation mm -hmm. the market side? It's our understanding that in order to, um, if you, you in fact have health insurance coverage that covers the cost, it has to be for a medical reason. So traction alopecia would not be covered in that case. Yeah, it just has to be like, you know. Alopecia areata would, but traction alopecia, which is totally preventable, is caused by styling, you know, bad styling choices, basically, um, where you end up killing the hair follicle. So it could be too tight braiding, um, you know, um, the sister locks that, you know, black women like to do or doing bad, you know, weave or uh, too tight ponytails as, you know, all women suffer from, from that, putting their hair up too much and too tightly. Um, it kills the hair follicle. So that is not considered medical, but anything else in that alopecia lane would be. Uh, was there one more? I feel like there was. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, great job, Diane and Pamela. Um, amazing presentation. And yeah, I'm going to switch us over, but excited to introduce uh, Phil from Arrow Social to come up and be our next presenter here. We are Arrow Social, and we are the only mobile social platform where you own your social content and you can monetize it. So that's a big station, a big statement, but here's the problem. So large social media platforms are basically owning the content and they're owning all the money as well. So all the content creators are basically doing all the hard work, but they're not receiving any of the money or they're receiving very little of it. There's only one major uh, player that's giving them anything. We don't really know how much they're giving them. Um, so all these influencers, we've interviewed over 200 of them, including Mr. Beast, and even he wants to make more money. Um, so how are we gonna fix this? So social media influencers and creators need to own their content. They need to control their content. And our recommendation is you need to pay out 60 to 70% um, by owning and controlling their content. So AeroSocial has developed a platform, which is a mobile platform. Um, it's got all the same capabilities that all these major social platforms have, including direct messaging. So the top content creators are gonna invite their followers. They can post, they can do everything they're used to on all the major platforms, but they will own their content. They will be able to control their content and be able to make the money. So the advertisers will also be able to do all the same great things that they do, but they'll be able to pick the influencers and be able to find the influencers and be able to directly contact, uh, directly contact them and see what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, so with that, we've had traction over the last three years with our beta and growing actually up through the 1300% growth. And we've had sales over the last three years as well, uh, growing up to $450,000. So we project in the eight, next 18 months that we'll see 400K users more and $10 million in revenue. Let me tell you how that's gonna happen. So with that, when talking with Mr. Beast, there's over 36 million um, influencers that have over four, um, 500K influencers or followers. So with that, some of them have met their cap, but they're also using multiple platforms. And so 
We're gonna do some training. I've been training over the last 25 years. I've trained uh, technical teams. I've trained uh, the team here at AeroSocial. And so they're, we're gonna be using Udemy type platforms and through collaboration and identifying these content creators and their followers with uh, high potential and fast growth, there'll be that same capability on our platform, right? So with that collaboration and partnerships with our <clears throat> all of our responsibilities and that growth, we'll be able to have that same type of revenue. So with that, on our platform, they'll be earning the 75% with our core, course, sorry, a little bit of dry throat with all the traveling. And then Aero Social will be earning the 25%. So with our example, we'll be able to take only 1,000 of these users. They'll have 1,000 of their, their followers, and that'll be 25 million. So if we only have 1,000 of these 36 million users, we can gain that 25%, right? And as we're gaining all this information, if we identify these influencers with that fast growth and have that content on our platform, <clears throat> we should be able to be gaining that 10 million over that next 18 months. With that collaboration, these influencers can be gaining that money as well as the money that they're receiving from the advertisement that we have. With all this, there's no red tape as long as they're on our platform. And then the content creators and the users will be able to <clears throat> share in that capability as well. With that, the market size is $181 billion. That 90, per, 90 billion that you saw is 50%, right? YouTube has 24 billion just in the US alone. And with that, we also see that we're targeting only <clears throat> the Gen Z in the US. So the competition is fierce as we're aware, right? But what we're seeing is that all the major players pay very little to nothing. And what we see that we don't think is fair at all is to have the influencers or the users pay. But we also see that YouTube is the major player that's paying 50%. But we don't know who they're paying to. There's all kinds of tier level capabilities that we don't know what they're paying. They're not telling who they're paying. They're obviously paying Mr. Beast quite a bit. Um, but we have been able to talk to him. Um, and he is using multiple platforms, probably about three different platforms. And he's actually had a comment on Twitter lately that he's actually paid $5 a month, which was actually a joke. Um, but there is Steemit. We are a cryptocurrency platform on Ethereum. And we do want to pay up to 75% and have folks use our platform. Our ask is 1.5 million for 10%. Um, with that, we will continually upgrade our platform um, and work with influencers and do some marketing and advertisement. The team that will accomplish that is myself. I've been doing systems engineering and training um, for the last 26 years. Uh, Lab has been able to uh, build the platform and bring several um, mobile platforms onto Apple. We've recently been approved to Apple. That's why we are a mobile platform, making sure that we are a mobile platform where most, um, sorry, <clears throat> where most Ethereum platforms are not on mobile and then we also see Jeff, who's been in securities for over 10 years, and Derek, who's been doing sales. Uh, my daughter's there on the right, who is, who is doing the uh, sorry, influencer um, relations, uh, who are uh, Gen Zers as well. So uh, appreciate uh, your time, and um, that QR code will take you to the website, which you can be a part of our growth and sign up for the Apple or Android versions available. If you have any questions, I'm certainly uh, open to any questions. I'll, I'll ask the chicken or egg question. Absolutely. Does the influencer come first or the user pay? 
Uh, the user base because we need advertisement to pay. Right. So I'm just asking. So I can see why you've given incentive to the influencers. Yeah. What's the incentive to. I mean, you know, people have tried to do kind of social. You know, launching social media platforms before with mixed yes. success. Yes. So there has to be an incentive for the user as well. So what's the incentive in this case? The incentive for the user is actually that 20% that you saw there. So the content creators and users are similar and they will get paid for their first click. Um, that's probably why I brought up my phone. So if you see a purple frame, when you look on our, hopefully there's one here. Uh, if you see a purple framed advertisement, the first click gets you two arrow tokens, right? So users are incentivized to view the advertisement and they get two arrows to view a advertisement, right? So, and then at the end of end of the cycle, they get 20% of the advertisement money that we receive. So users have a, have an incentive to be a part of the, part of the process because they are content creators as well, right? Everybody's an influencer. Oh, sorry, you had a question or was that similar? So, uh, All right, yes. Um, how do you see yourself aligned with basic pension token? And are you issuing a token or how do you transact this money? Is it all in US dollars? Is it? Yeah. All right. So the, the I'm going to repeat the question. So the the question was, how are we aligned with BAT, and then have we issued a token? Is that the, the correct question? Well, not, not specifically. How do you align? But very, as he would mention, the consumer connection, Con, consumer the side. Space. They're servicing both sides of this market. So correct. You have to understand how they. Align. All right. So BAT. My understanding of BAT is they went to, um, they went. They went to like um, the, I guess my understanding is they went more towards the just putting together like Chrome, right? From what I saw, they put together Chrome and just put together like Safari or something like that. Is how I, is how I saw what BAT did, right? Brave, yeah, brave, right? And then BAT kind of just, from what I saw BAT do, is just kind of did something like that, right? Um, and I really didn't see what BAT did after that, right? Have they done anything else that I've missed? Like, I think they're still trying to build that relationship right. as well, right? Yeah, so. they're still trying to do something. So it's, it's, like, and that they, they changed their white paper, and like I haven't really seen them accomplish anything else. So yeah, then my second question is: Are you issuing a token? So we have issued we have issued a token. It is the arrow. It is the arrow token. A R R O. It is listed on uh, Hotbit, uh, Dex Trade, and it is also on Uniswap. Um, and so. Since it is a um, it is a utility token, uh, the other thing that we are doing in the future is building a game uh, that's coming out. I think the projection is 30 days is a game, and the other uh, product we have is a streaming service for to providing utility for our token holders. Um, yeah, great job. Good job. Thank you. All right. Yeah, excited uh, to have Alicia from AO Planner come up next. Set up here. 
you good to go? Hi there, my name is Alicia Overton. I am an administrative professional with over two decades of experience in the administrative support industry. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about my startup, the AO Planner Company. So its mission is to champion the community that I love the most, uh, the administrative professional community. And I wanted to create a product that supports our high level of organization. Um, let me just say up front, I'm going to put a disclaimer out. I recognize that a planner is probably a boring topic. Paper is probably a boring topic too. But if you allow me to take you on the journey, I'm, I want you to kind of dig in and see if you change your mind a little bit. So the problem, I want you to visualize this in your head. If you are blessed to have an admin in your office or uh, caring for you professionally, I want you to visualize this in your head. You've probably gone to their desk at some point in time. And here's the scene that you probably saw at their desk. You probably saw a desk calendar. You saw post-it notes taped to the bottom of two double monitors. You probably saw a pile of notebooks, probably two, three, or four. And I would imagine that there are post-it notes on the walls and scrap papers near their phone. And imagine, keep that visual in your head, imagine that they are caring for you, executives, teams, projects, all of those things, and they're doing it effortlessly and not complaining about it. That scene is not uncommon for administrative professionals, and that was the problem. That pain we've managed to live with for years. And um, really, quite honestly, the thought of it, we've just made peace with it. And so in making peace with it, it's wasted time, it's wasted resources, dare I say, missing important information. And um, I just, I couldn't, I, it would, came from me. I, I've experienced that. I, I, I've experienced that. And so, um, how do we fix the frustration? So why now? Well, according to Zipia, in 2022, there are over 3.2 million administrative professionals across the US alone. And if you include everyone that we care for, both professionally and personally, <laughs> no one needs to be more organized than we are. And to deal with the pain that we have, I said, let me see if I can figure something out. And when we're at our best, that means that everyone that we care for is supported and cared for well. And that is the goal. So what's the solution? Welcome to the AO Planner. So I've come up with an idea that will deal with the pain that we'll never have to deal with it again. Um, and what it is is a undated one month planner that combines four key elements that we use on a daily basis. Month at a glance, daily scheduler, meeting notes, and brainstorm space. So of course, there are tons of planners on the market. What makes the AO planner different? It's streamlined, it's simple, and it's intentional design allows the user to have the ultimate planner experience. And by putting, a, putting your schedule, your notes, and your plans in one location, you centralize your life. And that is the goal of the planner. So let's talk market size. The one customer will equal a minimum of $660 annually. If you take 10% of the target customer base that we have, that I have the, the uh, administrative professionals, then uh, you have the option of, not the option, I apologize, uh, the sum of $211 million. And that's just a minimum, that's the approximate. And if you know us, we are the office search engine. So everyone comes to us to ask us for the best products that are on the market. So we always convince people to uh, 
buy those products. And we are fiercely loyal, so that is our secret sauce. So because it's a planner that does that, there is, uh, that has that, um, that goal of being simplistic, then that additional revenue is possible. But that's just the beginning. Let's keep going and talk about digital. So the digital, my MVP, I'm sorry, my MVP, the physical planner is uh, what's out now uh, and it is available for purchase. The second stop, and it's the first in the AO planner's roadmap. The second stop in the roadmap is a freestanding application that is mimics the uh, physical planner. And it will have its own internal cloud storage and be offered through a monthly subscription basis. So where does the digital come into place where you blend digital experiences with physical ones? Well, the third stop is smart pen technology that will connect and marry those two places. And so to create the ultimate digital planner experience, my vision is to move into B2B. So I want you to imagine this. The ability to take an administrative professional's power to capture thoughts and ideas in a meeting. And so oftentimes you can experience, you may have experienced this where sometimes those thoughts get lost. Imagine those handwritten notes put into a tangible thing and then shared instantaneously with an executive. And so you have a win-win. The EA or the administrative professional is working in their genius and the executive gets to access that genius. So let's talk traction. Um, I can proudly say that I am my cap table and um, I, I pride myself in being able to say that. I bootstrapped along with a very small crowdfunding uh, campaign with uh, iFund Women. And with those funds, I created two prototypes, conducted three beta tests first, and then I launched my MVP. Um, the next immediate milestone that I have for the planner is to come out of pre-sale launch mm -hmm. and go into official launch. And so that would, uh, require me to uh, update my website, make sure that I have my inventory, and I wanna really dig into uh, customer feedback and making sure that I am reaching my target customer in the right way. So my team, I'm it. <laughs> I am a solo founder and um, I got to say that it's been a wonderful ride to experience all of the things to create this idea that was a five minute drawing that I had in my head and then bring it to life uh, from a challenge. Uh, just a fun fact, before I became an administrative professional, I worked in the banking industry. So that I've married those two industries and though that was experiences in working in banking to uh, really help me see figure numbers and understand what it is and what it takes to, to run a business. So it afforded me the exposure of budgets, change orders, negotiations, contracts. It has been super helpful to me to have that background. And then marrying it with supporting C-level executives has been, uh, it's been uh, the best for me to be able to get to this place that I'm at now. So my ask, my ask is I made sure that I was intentional about breaking down every aspect of any funding that I would receive for the foundational areas of my business. Um, an initial investment of half that money will get me to my second stop on my roadmap. And that's what I'm looking for. But most importantly to me, I feel like connection is just as important as the money. And so having a, uh, a mentor in the e-commerce space, uh, specifically that can manage, that knows how to work within the planner and stationary industry would be awesome. Um, I feel like knowing who I am as a person, 
I am a sponge and with the right uh, partner, I can pivot and execute quickly. And at the same token, the, mo the most important goal of any startup is to make sure that you're de-risking for your investor. So that is my goal. That's it. I hope that you got a good idea of where, the, where a planner can take you. And if you are blessed to have an administrative professional in your life in some way, shape, or form, treasure that person. They are a huge access to you. And in celebration of Administrative Professionals Month, which is April, and the day is next 20, is the 26th, then I will say support the AO Planner Company. You will not be disappointed. Um, that's it. If you have any questions, love to answer them. Yes, I do. The AOPlanner.com. There are also QR codes on all of the documents for all of the Oh, there are QR codes on this one. I'm so sorry, y'all. Ignore me. I lied. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Sorry. I have a few questions. Okay. This is this concept, I'm not to discourage you, right? And that we can, this concept is not how unique this concept is, right? In the world of AI, which is coming along, right? Uh, physical is good. I mean, I didn't see your progress. I don't know about physical. But everything is going to digital economy, digital world, right? But AI as such, right? You have conversational bots, you have conversational, a lot of AWS provides, GCP provides, and how we are trying to use that technology stack. I think you're looking for 250K from technology perspective, right? Do you have on the 250K exactly, like like small, small milestones where you're going to come up with the digitalization of this product? Good question. So I have a tech advisor that I've been working with since I started, uh, started the idea last year. And so we've uh, created the wireframes. And I think to answer your question, Question: I need to get a software application developer and a fractional CTO to help me navigate through what it is that I want. I'm I'm a I'm a very limited tech person, but I've worked in tech long enough to understand that those positions require money, so they are not going to be cheap. Now I could very well say that I can give you a breakdown, but I think it would be unfair because this is really just the beginning of, of, my, of my journey in regards to the application. But I will say this much. I did speak to a couple of dev shops. One dev shop said that they could create my application for $60,000, maybe $65,000. The challenge that I had with that dev shop was they continued to talk about the change orders that were going to come along the way and very different from what they sold me from the very beginning, that they would create the application, it would be one and done. And so I'm smart enough to know that if I'm going to pay them initially 60,000, they're going to ask for another 60,000. So I might as well, well hire someone in-house that will work for me and that I can talk to them and they can do what I ask. And I think that is probably the route that I want to go. I think it's the safest route because if there's anything that's true is everyone, I mean, I'm not going to knock them. They, it, business is business. But I also need to be smart because if I'm asking for someone to invest in me, then I want to make sure that I'm being judicious with the funds that I receive from them. And I am the person that let's get to point A, the fastest, quickest, and least expensive way we can get there, but still have the same quality. And that's what I want to do. Well, great. Um, do, you, do you have, like, I know, like, on the phys digital side, you said there's a subscription model that you're going to do. Why are you looking after? Because the question is, you have a lot of competition in this market, right? Because, and not do that because I'm not. No, no, no. I appreciate that. Thank you. A Thank lot you. Of competition in this market that every week comes in, like, we look at Microsoft and others, right? Like if you have to look at teams, right? It can come with a planner by itself. 
So that will be the entire industry. Like, what is the your look at your competition and what is subscription price? We're looking forward to because that will really drive the conversation from the investors, right? How much are you looking for? Whether you get really the money out of what you invest into 50k from technology perspective. So my initial thought for the pricing for the monthly subscription was $10 per month or $110 for the year annually. So that's my first, that was my first idea, but that is a person that had not been to prepare for VC. And that was the, a person that had not spoken to other um, people in the industry for IT. So to answer your question, that's the base that I would start at. But once we dive into what it's going to cost to create it, what's going to cost to test it, what's it going to cost to have any other iterations of the application before it even launches, then ergo why I've budgeted for that. I'm thinking you could very well build the best application for me, right? And then we come back and then whoever signs up for it says, it's the worst thing on the planet. So now we got to go back, look at the feedback, and then say, where do we need to make adjustments? Where do we need to make tweaks? That in itself, depending on what those tweaks are, it could be a, a little bit of expense or it could be a little more expensive. So I'm, I'm coming from the lens of one, when I'm targeting for right now, I'm targeting my, my community. I understand my community better than anybody because I've been in it for the longest. So I understand exactly how we function and I know exactly what they would want. And so when they give me feedback from using the application, then we can get into the, the semantics of, well, can it be different? Will we need to change models to fit other people, other other styles of people because i understand that there are a lot of people that are completely digital they want nothing to do with want nothing to do with paper and there are tons of applications out there i i feel very unique in my space so that's why i recognize that there's competition i know specifically rocketbook is my competition i've had uh, people tell me remarkable is my competition um, i've also heard of sunsama they are my competition as well. What I've been doing is looking at the customer feedback for each of them to see what it is that they've been complaining about. And my product, I truly believe, will answer those complaints. Yes. So I, I love the space. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of productivity and everything up there. Uh, business question. Could this be a viable business if you never had software? Like, is, is, does it have to does it have to come together, or is it, like is the software more of a stepping? Is it is the software an add-on product, or does the planner work, and does the business work without the software? Well, interestingly enough, I bought my planner with me. So if you'd like to see it, you're more than welcome. Um, and I truly believe that uh, my initial thought, um, just to give you some background, my planner came out of a challenge. Someone said to I was complaining that the planner that I had set, the planner that I had settled on. It starts with a complaint. Yeah, it, it started. It started with a complaint that the planner that I had settled on and that I liked, it was oddly out of stock. And I'm like. If you know any administrative assistant, we don't like to be without our planner. It's like, that's, it's Bible. <laughs> so, so literally I'm in a mastermind group and one of my mastermind members says to me, at least make your own and we'll buy it. And I looked at her and I was like, what are you talking? She's like, make your own and we'll buy it. I sat and I made it. And so my goal was, I was initially thinking that I would target one area of customer. And I realized after my beta test, administrative professionals were my, were my customer. I am my customer. And their response, their repeat customers. So yes, I truly believe that my planner could be viable without the technology. Yes. Okay. So uh, am I understanding this correctly that, and, and I'm like, honestly, I, 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 was, I was paying attention, but your, your, your customers, administrative professionals, like, is that like probably like 90% of your customers or it happens to be like 
I, I'm trying to, you know, because like I'm the productivity person, but like, would you expect to sell to me as just some dude out there trying to, you know, get through life? Or is your market administrative professionals? They have a budget. They're buying, you know, they're buying this stuff. They have a job. No, I want everyone to have my planner. I want the entire, I want world domination. Let me just put that. In. I just want, I, I, I'm just going to put it out there. I want, I want world domination. So, so with that said, the people that responded to it first were administrative professionals. I'll give you an idea that I have in my head that um, could help you. I recognize that there are some people that don't want to be responsible for any ounce of their day. They don't want to schedule anything about their day, but they want to see what they're doing for the month because they're planning for the year. That's a different type of person. Still can be a service provider in some ways. So for example, a photographer, a brand strategist, a, um, a stylist, people that have businesses where they're, they're caring for other people, but they don't need to know the minutia like an administrative professional. The, the beauty of my planner is, is that it is, it's fluid. Because it's simple in design, it's fluid. So I can take out the daily scheduler portion and increase the month at a glance. And now you have meeting, uh, the month at a glance, meeting notes and brainstorm space, which everyone loves. And now you have something that can reach a different audience. So my goal is to first champion my, my community. But because I'm doing that, everyone else always benefits because we know what other people need. It's what we do. We nurture people. We care for people. So we always give them things that will help them. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I would absolutely buy a planner from an administrative professional. As someone who's used planners, like multiple different kinds of planners in different fields, and I've used Rocketbook as well, and it's just one of those things where it's like it's still missing this thing that I need or whatever. So I'm especially interested to look at your planner because, you know, as a program manager, who runs a weekly mini conference every single week, that's what Venture Cafe is, you know, we have our networking, but we also have multiple sessions. Like, that is something I would love to just have tangibly, physical, yes, but also within that software. So that sounds awesome, and I definitely want to look at it. So. Yeah, that that is probably one of the biggest challenges. If you, when I was doing my one-on-ones with my testers, that's what we end up doing. We'll buy a planner that we like. We'll use it for two months. We're like sick of it, toss it. It gets tossed in the garbage or wherever it's going or in another pile. We buy something else to compensate for it. We still don't like the compensation. And then, of course, what ends up happening is we have those extra notebooks. And so imagine trying to figure out which important piece of information, where'd you put it? Where'd you put it? And so that has been always been the challenge. And I got so frustrated because I'm carrying around three notebooks. I'm carrying around my planner, two additional notebooks. I've paid probably about $150 for all of them. And it just didn't make sense. I said, I want it in one location so I can stop stressing myself out. So I, I, you're, it's ready. It's here. If anyone wants to see it, I'll happily pass it around. Yes. Question is, um, it's not a clear question, but I'm going to ask it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was originally going to ask digital versus analog. And uh, this guy up here has brought that question kind of already. And so, so then as I listened to the conversation, I thought, well, all right. So, you know, are the administrative assistants today going to stick with the paper or analog? And what about Gen Z? If you, you have any idea if, if, if over time, and switch over to all digital because you know my challenge in every day is stuff I have to haul around in my backpack, and so it's hard to believe that it won't all shift to digital. Okay, so you think about start from a long question. So then you think about digital, and you say, all right, well I use Google Chat, I use Teams, I hate Teams, <laughs> and I use Zoom. I hate, uh, I don't hate Zoom, but I hate Teams. But none of them are are are, are satisfactory, and so. You know, your insight would really help in the digital 
and in analog. So I'm curious how you see that. So I would say that one of the things that becomes a challenge is knowing when you're dealing with paper and you're dealing with emails and you're dealing with schedules and things like that, the biggest challenge is the priority and setting the priority. And then when you set the priority, so I'm, so what I'm sharing with you is what you're describing on how you function in a day. Administrative professionals, what we do is we kind of analyze your life and then give you the best direction on how to manage it. In regards to the planner itself, I think one of the things that came out of my beta test was, Alicia, will you do a digital version of it? And in my initial thoughts, <laughs> was I just want to prove the concept of my planner first before we go well, off and do that, that right? That's a good decision, yeah, right. I, I wanted to do that first. But the response that I got from the survey said to me, more than one, I'm a firm believer, if more than one person says the same thing, then it makes it true. <laughs> and I had a lot of people ask me, will you make an application? And when I thought about it, I want you to visualize this. If you didn't even see the planner itself, the physical planner, Opening up your app, you can go to your day. Let's say it's today. You click on a meeting that you have. So let's just say this meeting at five o'clock. You'll have a drop menu so that you can go directly to your meeting notes on that day and start writing your notes. And it will have its own place. You won't have to ask where'd you put it because it will be within the application. That is my dream that I'm trying to build. So if a person that is a Gen Z that does not want to deal with paper, I can give them that. And imagine if you're a student in MIT being able to specifically go to locations where your notes are that are really important and you're not wondering where you put it within the application or did you share, did you save it in OneDrive? Did you save it in Dropbox? All of those places. Having it centralized is what my goal is. Yeah, I mean, that, that's my challenge every day. I've got a Google Drive, Nolan folders, and that's where I keep my notes for each. Moment. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm with you because for me, before I came up with, before I started talking with my tech advisor and he started pushing me to kind of really think past myself and what it could be, that's exactly what I was thinking. I'm like, okay, so I have personal information in Dropbox. I hate OneDrive, despise it. <laughs> just despise it. So I'm not using that. And and it's so funny, my laptop kept telling me, set up your OneDrive. I'm like, never is gonna happen. So so if you're if between between all of those locations, that was the other thing. It could it wasn't just the physical planner and having to deal with multiple notebooks or what have you. It's also the digital. It's like multiple applications, multiple notebooks and planners, multiple just it's too many multiples. Let's just centralize it. Perfect. Yeah, amazing job. Um, and yeah, I'm going to pull up our last presenters tuning in uh, virtually here. I'm going to pull up, um, here we go, Mike to join us. Uh, hey. Greetings from Cow Country, Nebraska. Can everybody hear me okay? So, good evening, everybody. My name is Mike Reyes, and I'm the founder and CEO of Pernamed. Pernamed seeks to give patients 24 7 access to their healthcare records. So the problem in this space currently is that patients do not have access to their historical medical records. So in the best case scenario, patients can go into a hospital consciously and they're able to regurgitate their medical information. A few weeks back, I was in the hospital with my mother. Her general practitioner referred her to an optometrist in the same hospital, same office, same nurse, same secretary. However, she still, because it was a different doctor, she had to actually fill out a new form. And it was very painful as a son to actually see the frustration on her face and her taking out medi medication from her, uh, from her purse and having to write down everything. 
also another problem in the space is that people in emergency rooms, we've all been in an emergency room. The last thing that's on our mind is having to remember who our emergency contacts are and important information about what allergies that we have and what diseases we're, you know, what, what medications we're taking for what specific diseases. So the solution that we're proposing is 24 seven on demand, real time access to personal medical data, allowing for proper personalized medicine and treatment for patients. I'll explain that. What we're gonna do is have an app on your phone. And when you click that app through biometric scanning, facial recognition, fingerprints, we're gonna be able to have you pop up, have a QR code pop up on your phone. And you're gonna scan that when you go out, every time you go to the hospital. The doctor on their end is gonna see a PDF. A caveat to this is they can see past information, but they can also add information and edit information. So when you get a prescription for a new medication or you have a new ailment, that when you go see a doctor in the future, they're able to actually see a timestamp of when medication was prescribed to you and the last time that you went to go see the doctor. So this is the perfect timing. We've already talked to Brown University Innovation and Tech Lab, and they've agreed to develop an MVP with us. The MVP will consist of a hybrid system of Filecoin and for Ethereum and Solana. For those of you in the crypto blockchain space, you understand what I'm saying, but I'll try to explain this as easy as possible for those of you who aren't. Filecoin is a system where you can store files on the cloud space without actual physical servers. Ethereum Solana is used to transfer information from point A to point B. So it'll be the system we'll be using to actually transfer medical records from our database system, Filecoin storage, to the patient's phone. Rhode Island, is that gonna be the first state in the country that has a digital identity system on the blockchain. We've already talked to them about launching a pilot program as soon as we finish our MVP. Last year, Rhode Island was the first state to launch a pilot program for certified public accountants on the blockchain. And this year on February 7th, they launched one for business registrations. We're gonna work with them to be the first movers in the space of medical records on the blockchain. So the competition. There are many startups and companies in this space. The main differentiating factor between us and them is that we're a public benefit corporation, B Corp. That means we have to balance patients and public good and profits. We can't just look at the bottom line, unlike our competitors. We're also going to be working in a public-private partnership with individual state governments, which gives us access to better quality data. So that brings me to my next point. Why me? I have these strategic relationships to make it happen. I also have experience in corporate training at hospitals and I've also managed sales team, uh, teams at green energy companies and I worked at Yelp as well for many years. Where, fun fact, I'm the only person in Yelp's history to actually sell their product, their ASCII's product in English, Mandarin and Spanish and a little bit of Cantonese too. So maybe three and a half. So <laughs> yeah, fun fact. So traction and roadmap. January 2022, I assembled a board of advisors. These range from people that uh, written for Bitcoin Magazine to the actual doctor that helped Estonia establish their blockchain healthcare database system and many others. This year in January, we joined the Prepare for VC Accelerator Program. It's going to be an alumnus. June of this year, we begin to develop an MVP and research paper. September, we're going to be onboarding our initial clients. And in January of next year, we plan to expand to the 47 other states in the continental United States. So our business model, very simple. Patients that want access to their health care workers have to have skin in the game. We're going to be giving people the option of paying $1 a month to hold their, to hold their records or $6 a year at the beginning of the year. That's half the market rate. That's the first tier. The second tier is we've already talked to companies in the pharmaceutical industry and they're willing to pay for a whole year's prescription of healthcare data sets $250,000 to $300,000 per year. Because we want to enter the market and compete with other more established firms, we're going to be giving them half the market rate at $150,000. So year one, we will be able to give them access to HIPAA compliant personal, uh, sorry, anonymized data. This is data that cannot be traced to a certain individual, a certain indi or a certain patient. Year one, in addition to anonymized data, will also be giving them the ability to purchase higher quality, more expensive personalized data. So for personalized data, we have to actually ask patients for the permission. 
Once we do that, if they give, say yes, we can not only waive the fee for a year or the monthly fee, but we can actually give them a compens compensate them rather for the ability to utilize their access, utilize their records in certain uh, promotional trials or medical trials with the third party firms. So our funding plan, we're looking for a $250,000 post safe note to develop our MVP with Brown University. After that, we're going to be raising between five to 10 million seed funding for development, HIPAA compliance oversight, administrative legal and accounting expenses, marketing and sales, and 30% for our team. So with that, I'd like to invite anybody who's interested in this opportunity to invest in the future of healthcare technology with us, Pernamed. And I'd like to end by asking you one question. Where are your healthcare records right now? And you have access to them. Thank you. Any uh, questions from the audience? <laughs> definitely, definitely. I was like, where is everybody? Also, um, please speak into the microphone so I can hear you. Uh, yeah, question back. Okay. Um, oh. Google, Microsoft all went into to try to get into the space of, you know, maintaining medical records. And they pulled out and had to work. You know, what's... Sure. You know, Microsoft, Google, a lot of the vendors yes. built these EMR systems on your phone, apps, whatever. But the issue was always the transfer of information, the privacy, the HIPAA, you know, consolidation in, in the right format. So you can do something with the data. So how do you how are you gonna overcome that and what makes you gonna be more successful than you know being all well, yeah. By the way, we have HIPAA compliance covered. And like I said, one of the, this is a, a multi-tier answer question. So one of the uh, benefits that we have is that Rhode Island's basing their system on the Estonia model. And we're actually gonna be working with Dr. Alice Kahana on developing the system of a similar system in Rhode Island. And with regards to trust, I look at it this way. Uh, hopefully this answers your question. The Libra, how many companies work with Facebook to establish the Libra coin? And they thought this was gonna be the biggest thing ever. It was gonna be like the, you know, the CBDC before CBDCs came into existence, this is going to be the coin that everybody used. It's a trust issue. Amazon, Google, all these other companies, they want to use this data, but they see it already as property of hospitals because it's a cheaper and more inexpensive way to access it and utilize it. We're establishing trust with patients because we're a B Corp. That gives us the advantage that we can actually put the records in the hands of the patients and they can decide how they want to use the data or if they want to have a third party use it for monetization purposes. And again, we'll be able to compensate them as well. And we're going to be working with state governments. So that's one thing that Gemini, the exchange, they had a first mover advantage. They were competing with Coinbase, but they had a first mover advantage in the space because they looked at the space and they said, we have to work with regulators to make this happen. They even talked to Mark Zuckerberg about that when he was making Libra Coin, work with the state regu regulatory bodies and the federal regulatory bodies as well. So that's our advantage that we have. We have the strategic relationships to actually make this happen. And it's gonna happen regardless, but we wanna be the first movers in the state of Rhode Island. Perfect. Um, and yeah, right behind you, there's another question. Okay. Uh, what are the legal issues that you have to bring to face? Oh, yeah, what legal okay. issues do you have to overcome? Legal issues. Oh. Okay, well, legal issues. Okay, so, so we're talking to Foley, uh, one of the big law firms, and HIPAA compliance, at least in the state of Rhode Island, we're going state by state. First, we're going to launch the most perfect uh, system we can in the state of Rhode Island. So the state of Rhode Island already has told us that as long as we abide by federal HIPAA compliance laws, we can function, our system can function in the state of Rhode Island. HIPAA compliance was made in the 1980s, I believe, to combat the HIV pandemic. It was so that, well, in, in a certain point, and I'll explain. It was to make sure that people were discriminated against because of their medical status. As long as we just respect that, and we don't have, the, we don't compromise medical data in a sense that people can, it can be used to discriminate against individuals because of their medical history. We're abiding by HIPAA compliance, but we're abiding by HIPAA compliance. And again, we're going to be working with Foley when we go to every single state as well, which is some of their, they work with Facebook and other major corporations. 
they're one of the best in the business when it comes to HIPAA compliance. Yeah, yeah, right. I thought that when the ACA came out 10 or 12 years ago, that there was some uh, murkiness about who actually owned, whether there was a joint ownership between the payer and the individual in terms of their own medical records. Is that been addressed in this? I believe I heard the question correctly. If I did hear it correctly, that's the problem that currently, for example, in the Massachusetts system, no, I'm not going to Massachusetts. A lot of the companies uh, in the pharmaceutical industry that use the data, the way they'll see it. You hear me okay? Uh, now the you're the data is that it's owned by the hospitals. We're looking to change the space and that we want to give ownership back to the individual. And again, at least in the state of Rhode Island, that can be made a reality very, very soon. And we've already, again, we've talked to the Department of Health, the Secretary of Commerce there, and we're going to make this happen regardless. So we're going to find any legal loopholes or obstacles that we have. I mean, it's going to happen, right? I mean, what Facebook was when it first started to what it is now, or even Twitter, what it, what it was when it first started to what it is now has changed, right? But we're definitely going to be able to legally, in a HIPAA compliant manner, give people ownership of their health care records. Perfect. Um, yeah, any other questions? Sure. Uh, yeah, one more. Perfect. I, I see from your roadmap, right? I think we are starting with an MVP on June of this year. Uh, and you think that MVP is going to take you three months, right? So I know you're looking for some funding, but how you came up with a three months and you have a digital breakup? Of how much would it cost to create an MVP as such? And how confident are you in, in, in getting there to the time when within three months you are ready, ready with the MVP? Jason, can you repeat that briefly? Sure. Yeah, just around the uh, confidence in the timing and the cost for building out the MVP. Yeah, so we've already talked about university and the department that we're going to be working with. We already have the system. We already know what we want to build. What we're focusing on now is our secret sauce, which I can't tell you right now, <laughs> which is what we're going to use to have shared IP with Brown University. So after that, launching the actual platform, again, Rhode Island's on top of this. The pilot programs for so the, so the last year when they launched the CPA pilot program, from the moment they launched it to the moment it was considered a success was six months. The business registration one this year, I believe it's four months. So our plan is to have the system launched and begin utilizing data right away, begin storing data right away. But that doesn't mean that we have to store every single citizen in the state of Rhode Island's data. That's just the beginning. Almost like an Amazon style model where we want to grow and expand to different states while we're, while we're increasing the amount of data that we store in the Rhode Island and the first states that we, we enter the market in. That's what we're confident in the speed that we're going to be able to actually implement the system in because we're gonna be working on growth and then growth and increasing amount of data at the same time simultaneously. Perfect. Yeah, great job and great answers. Well, <laughs> I hope yeah. so, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, at least the Celtics are winning, so it is what it is. <laughs> and uh, Bruins are coming up next. Um, but yeah, I just wanna thank everyone uh, once again for coming out to our demo day events and supporting all the startups in our cohort. Um, and yeah, this was, the live stream will actually be available as a recording too, to go back and watch and um, kind of, you know, hear anything you missed from the presentations and kind of with the re remaining time here, uh, just get to know each other and um, continue networking. And uh, yeah, we'll see a lot of you at um, the TechCrunch conference and some of our other events this week. And yeah, really appreciate, you know, everybody coming out and great work by all of our startup companies. Thank you. <laughs>